Hello, everyone. Thank you for listening to the Code Life podcast. The Code Life podcast provides a forum for discussions on healthcare issues and challenges with specialists of diverse backgrounds. I'm your host, Sylvie Riendo. Today, I'm inviting you to listen to a recent interview hosted by the Montreal General Hospital Foundation with a well-known management professor in the Dizotel Faculty of Management at McGill University, Professor Henry Minsberg. Minsberg is the author of 19 books and 180 articles. He devotes himself largely to writing and research on managerial work, strategy, forms of organizing, and rebalancing society. He has worked for the past two decades in collaboration with colleagues from Canada, England, France, India, Japan, and Brazil on developing new approaches to healthcare management, education, and development. He has most recently completed a book entitled Managing the Myth of Healthcare, which he spoke about. He was interviewed by Dr. Phil Gold, Professor of Physiology and Oncology at McGill University, who also served as Chairman of the Department of Medicine at McGill and as Physician-in-Chief at the Montreal General Hospital. He is presently the Executive Director of the Clinical Research Center of the McGill University Health Center. A very interesting encounter on a topic that is of the utmost importance in our healthcare system. Dr. Gold started by asking Professor Minsberg where his interest for healthcare came from. Enjoy the discussion. I guess as we get older, I, I, I'm amazed at how many of my colleagues who have written a lot um, start writing about healthcare in their later years. I, there's something, maybe it's because uh, we're sort of thinking we better know more, or maybe we want to make friends with people in the medical community who are going to need increasingly, um, or maybe it's, you know, maybe it's just sort of a broader thing to do. The way older business people get more concerned with social responsibility, maybe, uh, maybe professors get more concerned with healthcare. So we created a program in, uh, that was mentioned in uh, 19, 2006, I think, um, to bring people from all aspects of healthcare together, uh, from all forms of healthcare, all kinds of people in healthcare uh, from around the world. And, uh, just one particular comment about them. I, we have another program that preceded it, which was for business people. Um, and, and we do things differently. They sit kind of the way you're sitting at round tables um, so that they can spend half their time learning from each other. These are people typically in their 40s, um, and they learn from each other. So they share their experience and so on. And uh, so it's a different kind of uh, thing, and the whole pedagogy is quite different. Um, but people who come to a program in business, normally and expectedly, uh, are concerned first with their own development, that's a natural thing to do, um, and secondly, if they've been spent, sent by a company, which many of them do, many of them are, um, to improve the nature of the company that they work in. What's interesting about the people in healthcare, at least the ones who come to our program, is they are absolutely devoted to healthcare. I'm, I'm absolutely amazed at that. They, they want, of course, they want to be developed. They're there to enhance their own capabilities, particularly as managers in healthcare. Um, but, um, and if they're working for a hospital or a clinic or a community health or public health or whatever it is, they want to improve whatever it is they're doing. Um, but they're there for healthcare. And this year, for the first time, with, a, with a, our sixth, seventh class, I think, I asked them, How many of you are here primarily for healthcare? And about 80% of them, out of the 40 or so people, about 80% of them um, said they were there for healthcare. So it's a, it's a very special field, I think. And uh, I'm, I'm really proud to, to be able to work in that field, too. Thank you for that, for the opening. Uh, I think that we're all here uh, committed to health care. I didn't realize it was that many years, actually. Um, this morning, about 8 o'clock, I had a group of second-year students. And one of them, who I had in undergraduate school, came over and said, you're still teaching, sir. That's wonderful. I said, you don't understand. This is not altruistic. One of you may have to look after me. <laughs> uh, so at the end of the day, I think we're all in the same boat. <laughs> Henry, you've written a library uh, full of uh, managerial books. And you've always been interested in healthcare delivery and how it should be done. But now you've written a book on healthcare management. Why now? 
Well, I guess kind of more or less what I was saying, but you know, it's always been there. So my doctoral thesis was a study of five chief executives uh, in, in the States. Um, three of them were from business. One of them was Charlie Brown, not from the comic strip, but uh, running the Newton School System. But the fifth was, uh, was um, John Knowles, who ran the Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, everything I've done, I, I, I'm not really a professor of business. I'm a professor of management and of organizations. So I've always been interested in all kinds of organizations, healthcare and other, and there's always been. So in a way, it's not new, because I've, I've done a series of articles, maybe six or eight, in healthcare. But I think you get drawn to, uh, to healthcare, maybe as you see yourself being, um, you know, uh, fragile. I'm, I, I wouldn't say I don't call myself fragile. But, you know, time goes on and you sort of get more aware of that. You're one of the tougher guys I know. <laughs> Fragile, no. Uh, my, all the questions have been vetted because otherwise they were afraid I'd go off on a tangent. I was going to, but decided against. Talk about the good old days. But we're going forward to the future, not backward. Um, one of the myths that you debunk in your book is that the healthcare system is collapsing. And yet you point out quite appropriately that uh, perinatal health is better, children are not dying at birth, uh, our uh, aging population is growing, which is another problem altogether. Uh, so at the end of the day, um, how long can we pull this off? What's the wall? When do we hit the wall? Well, it, you know, it's kind of like, I mean, the, the, wall, the wall is a choice of several things. One wall is to throw it to the market and say, if you're not wealthy, tough. Uh, we're not about to do that in this country. Right. Um, the other wall is to start um, using the R word, which is a taboo word, rationing. Uh, we ration all the time in healthcare. If you've got one nurse in an ICU with two patients and both bells go off, that nurse is rationing. So the, the, the rationing is built in. We're not allowed to talk about it. But rationing is always built in. So, so another choice is rationing. My choice is to face the fundamental problem. And the fundamental problem is the following. You guys and lots of you out there are very good at finding brilliant ways to extend our lives. And that's why we're living longer and healthier and so on. You're very good at that. The only trouble is a lot of it is expensive. Okay? So, the reason we're living longer is because we have to spend more and more. And who's going to forfeit? Look, if you're sick, uh, we, the, the problem on the other side is we don't want to pay taxes. Okay? And, and, and if you think about what taxes were, right now we've got in Quebec about 15% sales tax, which hits, every, which hits everybody equally. Uh, we don't want to pay income tax. We don't want to pay sales tax. We're avoiding taxes all over the place, and so governments get squeezed. So the government is sitting with a situation where it's got to provide, in this country, it's got to provide health care services, and the population doesn't want to pay for it. Okay? And, and that has to be faced. Because the only way to deal with it is either less services, or stop the innovation, or let us die sooner, or pay for it. Um, I don't think we're frivolous. There are parts of health care where we overspend. But I don't think we're frivolous. And I would argue that for every hypochondriac, there's probably 10 people, if you'll pardon the expression, who avoid health care like the plague. They become more expensive because they come finally when they're really sick. Um, but it's not a problem of hypochondriacs. And it's not a problem of physicians the way it is in, more so in the States, of physicians doing all kinds of tests that may not be necessary. So, the only way to do, deal with it is to face the situation. Either we cut the services we're getting, which we don't want to do, or we figure out how to pay for it. And the option of paying for it would come in what fashion? Well, you know, if, if, if you get sick, why should I pay for you? I mean, I'm, you know, I'll never get because sick. Because you're a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> but if I get sick and it costs half a million dollars to save me, of course I expect my government to pay that. Right. Okay. There was a story about a, about a 90-year-old guy in Vancouver who insisted on a hip replacement because he wanted to keep jogging. That's a true story, apparently. So, so who's to say no? I mean, they might say no in that case. They didn't. Um, the story of a, of a surgeon, uh, you know, a heart transplant surgeon, who calls the head of the hospital and he says, 
I have a heart, I have an operating room, uh, I have a patient, I have no budget. Uh, what's the head of the hospital going to say? And of course, if that person says no, that's not on. So if they say yes, then they're going to have to face the music when, when the health authorities, whether it's insurance companies in the States or, uh, or government in Canada, same thing, are going to say, why did you do that? Uh, in your book and in a number of papers, you talk about the four C's of care, cure, control, and community. In the context of what we have here tonight, happily, largely community, how, how do you see this coming together in terms of what we're doing? <clears throat> There's a lot of care and cure and control in the room, too. I think. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we've got managers in the room. We've got physicians. Well, all the managers, please stand up and take a bath. <laughs> <laughs> But, but there's a fifth C, too, that's missing out of there, which is uh, cause. I'm, uh, one of my big things today is that medicine is much too oriented towards cure, or at least treatment, at the expense of cause. You know, uh, what's his name? Um, Jonas Salk never cured a kid of polio. He didn't have to because he eliminated polio by addressing its cause. So, so uh, but, but, you know, I did a paper with Sholem Globerman that some of you may know. He was associated with the Vic for a while, and and, and we we did four quadrants of healthcare, okay, and and uh, and we called them uh, by these words: care, cure, control, and community. Um, and and our argument was that many of the problems in healthcare are these divides, these solos and slabs, these horizontal slabs and vertical solo ver vertical. Solos, silos between those four, and they don't talk to each other sufficiently. Um, and uh, well, there was a wonderful story uh, I was telling you before. Of, I did a study. I was working in the Jewish General Hospital at one point, and, um, and they were really in crisis in the emergency room. Um, and the head of the emergency room was on the medical executive committee, so it was on the agenda every single meeting. And it was on the agenda of the nursing executive committee every single meeting. And it was on the agenda of the management committee every single meeting. And it was on the agenda of the board every single meeting. None of those committees interacting very much. There was very little overlap in membership. And it went on and on and on until the government here finally did something clever. I wish they'd do something else clever. Um, but governments are crude. Uh, but this was an interesting, crude intervention. They said, we'll cut your budget by $2 million unless you solve this problem. So you know what? They took the assistant head of nursing. She created a committee with people from all the four quadrants, and they solved the problem in a few months, a problem that had been festering for years. So you've got to bring community, which is what many of you are, are, are about, with, with cure, which is what medicine is about, and care, which is what nursing and other professions are about, and control, which is what management or administration or government or insurance companies right. are all about. Okay. And the Montreal General and, of course, the MUHC are now focused in a lot of specialized areas. For example, here, and David Mulder happily is here tonight, uh, started up a trauma center. How does this phenomenon of specialization fit into your phenomenon in terms of care, cost, et cetera? Well, I mean, we wouldn't have modern medicine without hyper-specialization. I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the special, sometimes the specialization is shocking um, because it's so narrow. Um, and, and part of the problem is to broaden it out. Um, but on the other hand, the, you know, it's the categorization process. Medicine is about categorizing. You come in with conditions. And, and what the physician wants to do is put you into one of their categories, like pain in your side, you know, uh, uh, app appendix uh, attack, whatever it is. They want to get you into their categories. And as soon as you get into one of their categories, they're very happy because they can pull out their protocol, uh, which has been tested and experience ba evidence based and all these kind of things, um, and do it for them. Um, and that's why that's the great strength. Of, of modern medicine. It's also the debilitating weakness of modern medicine because if you don't fit in the categories, tough. Um, and you don't fit in the categories in three different ways. One is, one is that there's no category for you. 
you know, IBS is not a medical category. It's, it's a label for ignorance. Okay, so if you have IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, whatever that means, uh, tough, you know, find an alternate practitioner, somebody maybe who cares about that thing. So one is you're beyond, you're outside the categories. The other is you're across the categories, you're geriatric and you present with six different problems and if they can deal with them sequentially, you know, do the cataracts last, then medicine works. But if they're interactive and they've got to figure out how they work together, they actually have to sit down and talk to each other, uh, which some physicians are prepared to do, but a, a, a number, you know, I always think that the model for coordination or communication in medicine is a few words scribbled on a piece of paper, handed to someone else, scribbles a few words back, and that's called communication. The, the third one is the one that interests me most because it's beneath the categories. Beneath the categories means that the categories aren't sufficient. And there's a wonderful article by Atul Gawande called The uh, Bell Curve. I don't, do you know that yeah. article? It's a wonderful article. You should read it. Uh, it was in The New Yorker. He's a physician who writes for The New Yorker on healthcare. Um, and he studied a cystic fibrosis physician <coughs> who had written all the protocols that were being used around the world, but he was getting better results than anybody else. And it's kind of like, well, they're using his protocols. Why can't they be as good as him? So Gawande observed this physician in action. And there was a young woman, 19 years old or so, and he, he, one of the lung readings was a bit low. And he said, um, are you doing your tests or exercises, or whatever it is? And she said, yeah. And, oh, and he turned to Gowande and he said, well, that's good that she's doing them because if this level remains this low, she'll take a few years off her life. At which point she broke down and said she had a new boyfriend and a new job and she couldn't find a way to do it. And he said, all right, let's sit down together and work it out, okay? In other words, he went beneath the category, beneath the patient. You know, patient in a way is a demeaning term. I'm not just a patient, I'm a person. And she was a person, and he got to the person beneath the patient, and that's why he did so well. Now, if he was practicing in Quebec, okay, somebody would say, what the heck are you doing spending 10 minutes with that woman when you're you know, programmed to spend three minutes with that woman? Don't tell me she's going to live longer. I can't measure that. All I can measure is how long you're spending with the patient. That's what's killing healthcare. Not that I want to say anything negative about our minister. Uh, but I think what you're saying is perfectly true. Uh, of all the things that Osler wrote, the one thing that stands out in my mind is his saying, listen to the patients. They're telling you the diagnosis. And Groupman just wrote a book called How Doctors Think, mm -hmm. in which he points out that the average time that he's been able to measure, if you will, the doctor saying, why are you here? Here being the office, the clinic, the emergency room. And the time the doctor interrupts is 18 seconds. Yeah. You can't learn a lot in 18 seconds. <laughs> so maybe we haven't learned how to, how, how, can, to, how to listen. You can get them into your category. By the way, there's a later study. It's now up to 23 seconds, apparently. Seriously. <laughs> Not gonna, I don't want to go getting, there. Getting no. better. All right. Um, no, no, it's true. I remember the 18. The way, at the end of the day, I think that's what we have to we, I mean, I constantly tell the, the, the yeah. students, listen. Yeah, and by the way, you left out a little piece. They never went back You're to right. hearing the patient. You're right. 18 seconds, that was the end of it. Yeah. We got you into a category. You know, give us a few words. We'll slot you into our category, and, and we'll send you down the hall to open your heart. And, you know. <laughs> I, I didn't know that Groupin was a friend of yours. <laughs> but in any event, look, Canada, uh, if you look at the various uh, ratings of cost of adults and governments and excellence in health care, depending upon what you read and who you read, we come between 15 and 30 out of 190 countries, with Myanmar being at the bottom, France or Iceland or one of the Scandinavian countries at the top. If we were going to simulate the phenomenon or look at a country to, 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 to try and copy, which one would it be in terms of where we are now and where we want to go? Well, you know, it's interesting because most Canadians would sort of look down that list and find out where America is and say, well, we're 18. We're ahead of but America, right. Yes. 31, you know, I mean, right. that's what we do. And, and unfortunately, that enters into how we run our healthcare system yeah. because we pride ourselves in, in Medicare. And look, what country on earth 
when, when the CBC did a poll of who was the most important Canadian of all time, Tommy Douglas won it. What was Tommy Douglas? He was the premier of Saskatchewan and, and the head of a small party in parliament during a minority government, so he managed to push them to adopt Medicare. And he, you know, it wasn't great, Wayne Gretzky, it was Tommy Douglas who became, <laughs> became the greatest Canadian of all time. So, so but, but, but what we're also influenced by, by, uh, by American attitudes. The rest of the world, for the most part, developed world, is not like the States, it's like Canada, and in many cases more so. England is in between. England is, to my mind, less like Canada, and, and a bit more like the States, in the sense that they have the dual system. Um, France, uh, companies like, countries like that seem to have it right, um, and they spend a lot. So what do they have that we don't? Common sense. <laughs> I can argue with that either. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I know that you've been very much interested in the international masters for health leadership, which is obviously becoming a very great phenomenon. You want to say a few words? Yeah, we, uh, I love that program. That, that program, as I mentioned before, about, uh, about people there for health care. Um, uh, and, and we have people from all over the world, and the current class has 16. Uh, I think it's about 38 students in about 16 countries. They average ages in their 40s. They're every imaginable aspect of healthcare um, and, and so many different countries. But may, let me tell you a story, which is the best we've done, but, but it's a nice, nice uh, bar to jump over. Uh, there was a woman in, uh, in a previous class named Joanne Liu, and she was an emergency room physician at St. Johnson's Hospital in Montreal who volunteered frequently for Doctors Without Borders, MSF, Médecins Sans Frontières. And she, um, she comes up to me in class one day and she says, you know, the program gave me a certain confidence. I'm going to run, I think I'm going to run for the presidency, the worldwide presidency of Doctors Without Borders. Members of her class formed her campaign committee she won. She's just been renewed for a second term. Uh, she's in Geneva. She's coming back soon now because second term will be over. Actually, we're having lunch tomorrow. And, um, but the interesting thing about that whole story is that when the Ebola crisis started, it started, as you know, in three small areas of those three countries. Um, it wasn't in the capitals of those countries. It wasn't in big cities. And who knew what was going on? Doctors Without Borders knew, because they're on the ground. They're on the ground. They treat. Okay? The World Health Organization has its offices in the capitals. They didn't know. Uh, they weren't aware of it. And Joanne was convinced that, um, that, she, that Doctors Without Borders couldn't ring the alarm bells, that the WHO had to ring the alarm bells. She went to see Dr. Chan, who was running the WHO, and convinced her to, uh, to uh, ring the alarm bells. And then the rest... You saw on television. You didn't see the first part on television. The rest is what you saw on television, with the whole world marshalling its resources to move in. And that was uh, because of Joanne. It would have been later. And God knows how many lives she saved. Right. Joanne ended up um, uh, addressing the Security Council of the United Nations. Yes. Um, look, not every one of our students does that. But we've got, you know, we've, we, one woman appeared in class. She was. She was running a big Ayurvedic hospital in India, it's Indian medicine. And she, had, she, had, she was in our master's program, but she actually had a PhD in biochemistry from Cambridge. Um, and she invented a copper coil that if you leave it in water overnight, it sterilizes the water. Yeah. Um, and she teamed up with other people in the class. Together they raised money, got a, got a prime preliminary grant, got a much bigger grant, and now they're going uh, worldwide with this thing. Pretty good. Um, it's only because, partly because you have interesting people, but partly because we're community. Right. Our program is community. Sitting at the round tables is community. Sitting and, and working together over a year and a half is community. They come every few months for, for 10, 11 days at a time. Well, I, I'm going to ask, I'm going to show the, the period open for questioning to the audience now, but before I do, I want to take a particular moment to say thank you to a number of people. To the foundation, to you, Jean-Guy, but to the foundation for what they do, 
to the community that's in this room for the support you give to us that allow us to function. Because frankly, with the government alone, I'm not sure that would work. So thank you to you. And there are some other people here that are terribly important to us. And those are our volunteers who are here every day in different clinics, uh, in different areas, and who do an enormous amount of work. So thank you to all of you. Give yourself a real hand. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Code Life podcast. Hope you learned a thing or two today. Professor Minzberg definitely brings many interesting points on how we could better manage our healthcare services, and it's always a pleasure to discuss with him. If you want to know more about us, please visit codelife.ca.